gate goes down and Thorpe's away and another good start from him. Just look how deep those ruts have become over this track. This is the man they're waiting to salute, the new 1985 World Motocross Champion, Dave Thorpe, as they close in to congratulate their hero. I was just pleased to see the chequered flag. I couldn't tell you where I finished, I just knew I wasn't out of 15. So, what next for Dave Thorpe? Well, I'm going to take a rest and then I'm going to get ready for next year. More determined than ever to try and keep it. Dave Thorpe, world champion. My first real memory was with Dad, with our little homemade special. I can remember Dad running behind me, telling me to break, put my leg out. They would be the first things, really. When I first really started to ride and race, I guess it's the pictures that spring memories back. I can always remember going to the races with my dad. My little bike would be on the back of the trailer and I'd watch dad race and then after I get to ride a little bit and that was really my treat. That was the bit that kind of sticks in my mind, the little bit up and down until someone got annoyed with the noise and told us to get off. Thorpe doesn't know it. Everybody else in the pits does. Surely now somebody's going to tell him they have. He's draped in the Union Jack. Thorpe's done it. The 26-year-old Honda rider from Berkshire is the 1989 World 500cc motocross champion. I feel, when I look back now in the 80s, there was a tremendous amount of riders that were capable of winning on the day. You know, you've got Eric Gibors, Andre Malab, George Bay, Huck and Carlquist, Holmes Kindergartner. The list goes on and on. Looking back, I'm just pleased that I raced at that time because the crowds were really big health and safety was less, everybody was closer, the atmosphere felt a little bit more engaging. And of course, we were all riding 500 two-strokes. The gate drops, they're underway already, somebody goes down. We're going into the first bend, it's Gabors who goes! Oh. The quality of rider, the, the friendliness that we had off the bikes was also quite nice. The interaction we had with the fans was very good because we were quite accessible then. It was a good time, good times to be involved in, uh, in motocross. Did I ever dream I would be? A dream that I might be, I think that's the key in it. Would, might. As a child growing up, as I got into schoolboy motocross, I did it because I loved it. At that point, there wasn't an end goal. Sacrifice is quite a big word, but it's probably really relevant. When I first started to get into the professional ranks, at that time, I was a young rookie coming in, and Graham, Graham Noyce, had already been world champion in 79. So he was obviously the bar for me in the races. For my dad, he was quite a useful tool because the things that he did right, my dad would always say, watch Graham, 
watch Graham, watch Graham. And, and I'm sure Graham won't mind me saying this, but he was one of the last rock and roll motocrossers. He lived life to the full. He trained hard, he rode hard, but he parted hard. And the social element of his life, my dad would always go, Dave, you don't want to be doing that. I don't think I went into a proper nightclub until I was 30 years old. So my social life with my friends wasn't actually the same as a normal 20-year-old going through it was very much dedicated to, to the sport. The off-road centre was first opened in 2011. I went to Honda UK with a plan of, you've got amazing bike in the showroom. A customer can come in, see it, feel it, touch it. But this is an opportunity for them to see it, feel it, ride it. And whilst with a road bike, you can ride it quite easily on the road out of the dealership, it's not always so easy to, to ride the bike off-road. So, you know, my main goal is really for people that have maybe ridden in their youth, maybe gone into business, family, come out the other side, got a bit more free time, a bit more disposable income, to come and relight that fire at the off-road school. That's really what I strive to do. And at that point, when they leave us, I always say, they've got a 50-50 chance of whether they sprite into the Honda brand or they go somewhere else. So a lot of customers say to me, what bike should we go and buy? And it's quite a simple conversation. I'm a Honda person through and through. The one thing you get with the Honda brand is you ride it, you wash it, you do the basic maintenance, put it in your garage, put it in your shed. You know when you go back to it, you push the button, kick the kickstart, it will go and do what it does, exactly what it says on the ticket. That's really the Honda, the word. It's, it talks about quality, reliability, and the best workmanship there is. When we go off-road today, it'll be the first time possibly that we've come across the, the wet. So for the riders, it will be slippery, braking will be straight line braking, nothing on the corner. We need to be more mindful of the ground being slippery after a long period of hard ground. The adventure roads trip come around for me quite late, but having experienced it, it's probably one of the most exciting two weeks of my life that I've had on a motorcycle. For an adventure bike, seriously, you just can't find a better place. I was quite pleased to see my bed sometimes at night. It was, there were long days and hard work, but the Icelandic thing will forever sit in my memory as um, yeah, one of the most exciting two weeks on a motorcycle. And, you know, we always say it, but if ever there was a terrain made for the Africa Twin, Iceland is the one. If we look back on the HRC 500 bike, it was without doubt the bike that was four or five years ahead of its time. HRC built a bike that uh, in the wrong hands was an animal. The power was quite frightening at times. The physical side of riding a 500 two-stroke was tough. It was a bike that could run away with you. It was a bike that you could, you could get in a lot of trouble with very easily just because of the way the power come in. That's Kurt Nickel number eight, and there's Dave Thorpe down in 15th place. Already he's carved his way through 20 places to get there. You know what, I kind of wouldn't change it for the world. I kind of, it's almost like um, people that ride horses, you know, if you ride a stallion, you know, you, you, you know you've got a beast under you. And um, the HRC 500s, in the wrong hands were definitely a beast. When you win as a rider, when you're on the track, I think that that process is about 
you, your mechanic and the bike. And there's a, there's a big element of self-satisfaction at that point. They get over the front end, ready for the gates to go down. Third gear, inching forward, and they're away. Dave Thorpe comes into the arena, leading the race. When you cross that line and you become a team manager, success is great. You are not totally in control because whatever you do in preparation for your riders, whatever the mechanics do in their preparation for the riders, when the riders sat behind the gate, you're not in control. There is a huge amount of pleasure in seeing the rider perform to his best ability, and if that means winning, then of course we all feel good. There is something about motorcycle sport that draws us all in, whether we win, lose or whatever. Everybody's goal is to win, of course not everybody can win. It's certainly something I still enjoy, you know, I'm, I'm 60 now, but I enjoy the winning aspect. That's what my book's called, isn't it? No Regrets. <laughs> I think the end. The end was one thing that I would have changed. So racing all the way through the 80s with Honda, with HRC. And at the end of 89, I left Honda to go to another brand. And um, realistically, looking back, that would be the only regret I had because hindsight tells me that if I'd have stayed with HRC, I'd have had another chance. Eric and I, when we raced together, we used to go through our racing career. We spent a lot of time together and we'd often discuss how we wanted it to end. And he always said to me, you know what, Dave? I'm going to win and then I'm going to quit. And in 1990, he won the World Championship. He got on a helicopter. He went straight to the Belgium studios and he announced on national television he was quitting. My conversation always with Eric was, oh, I don't want to do that. And he'd always say to me, why? It was because I didn't want to get to my age now and wonder if I could have done it one more time. I wanted to know that whatever made me special in my racing career had just dripped away. I didn't want to have any regrets in my older life. And it was two athletes that were top of their game but had different views on how they wanted it all to, to stop. <laughs>